Welcome. Hey, Jules. How are you? Oh, we got you on mute still. We got to take that off. Let me help you out there. There you go. Hey. I am great. Happy to be here. Good. Likewise. Happy to have you here. Let me run through a couple housekeeping items real quick, and then we'll kind of jump into the presentation and talk. So students, you know the drill. Without further ado, let me jump into the deck. Nick, can you just do me a favor and verify you see it for me? Roger that. Thank you much. Okay, students, couple of housekeeping items today, not too much. Uh, the attendance breakdown that we promised where you'd be able to see every week and your attendance grade for it is all in Canvas. So you can go in there and see at any point in time, whether you had a grade that was missing for a given week, if there's something that you're confused about, just send us the note to that ENTR email address. Let us know, we can get that corrected or looked at for you. Um, heads up that the mentorship question number two is due on Monday, 11.59 p.m. So I strongly encourage you to go into the announcements and again, look at the, um, the past few that I've put out there about how to format those questions following up. Um, I tweaked a little bit of the submission uh, guidelines for those of you who have already submitted, I'm sure it's perfectly fine, but if you haven't, just go in there and take a second look at it again and uh, go ahead and then submit your question by Monday, 11.59 p.m. And the journal entry, the next one is due March 9th. So yeah, a little bit of time still, but want to give you a heads up so that you can get your heads wrapped around uh, what you might want to put in there and uh, your reflection on the past couple speakers that we've had. To that point, we have an awesome speaker here with us today. We have Jules Pierre. She is coming with us, or coming to join us, I believe from Boston today, if, if my, my research serves correctly. Uh, she's an investing partner in X-Factor Ventures, which I can't wait to talk about. She's the author of a book called How We Make Stuff Now, uh, which was named in 2019 as one of the 11, uh, one of the 11 books entrepreneurs must read by uh, Incorporated Magazine. She's the co-founder and former CEO of The Gromit. Um, you know, she was named as one of the most powerful women entrepreneurs by Fortune Magazine. She has some affiliation with some school in Boston, starts with an H. I'm not really sure of it. I don't know, maybe she can tell us about it. Uh, she served as an EIR there for a little while. And in fact, she was the longest serving EIR in what was a, a very coveted role. So that certainly speaks to her ability to uh, build some connections and maintain relationships and maintain her, her position in that role. Perhaps most importantly, as always though, she is a Michigan alumni and she graduated with a uh, degree in industrial design, graphic design in French. She worked uh, as a football referee in the men's intramural team when she was here, a softball umpire and as she was a startup designer. And she's here to join us today and give us a little bit of an education on everything she's learned over a uh, incredible career. So Jules, thank you so much and without uh, anything else i'll let you take away the presentation i'll advance it for you and uh we can then have a conversation yeah sure thanks i'm i'm really happy to be here uh it's really exciting i've maintained my connections with michigan um also through serving on the alumni association board so i'm in ann arbor more than i used to be and more plugged into the scene there than i used to be so I'm, i i really enjoy that i'm five years into that role um, I have tried risk failed a ton um, and I'll give you a really quick summary of my career, but that's not what I'm going to focus on. I'm going to focus on what I did at your age to be able to try risk fail a lot. Um, I backed into it accidentally, I suppose, but the career is just, I'd say three buckets that you might want to know about. One is as an industrial designer, what I studied at Michigan was the first part of my career. I did go to that school that starts with an H, the first designer to go there for to get my MBA after working as a designer. So designer, number one. Number two, I worked um, out of business school in a startup as, as uh, ultimately vice president, bringing in all the business, a, a company called continuum. That was my first startup and it was not a popular thing to do. I was the only person in my HBS graduating class to join a startup. So I was very contrarian in that choice. Worked there five years. Uh, then I had a big company phase. So designer, entrepreneur, big companies. 
and I worked in a bunch of brands whose names you'd know. Some of them, um, if you're international, you might not know all of them, but um, the brands were Stride Right and Keds uh, shoe companies and Hasbro, the toy company with the Play School brand. And um, those big companies had one theme for me. I was following a boss. I got a boss that I really admired who landed on my head, Meg Whitman. She's famous now, she wasn't then. She was CEO of eBay, CEO of Hewlett Packard. She ran for governor of California and she helmed the recently failed Quibi. So she's, she's a big deal. But I worked for her before she was a big deal and she was worth my time. I followed her from one company to a second to a third. And then I um, moved to Ireland for four years, came back and um, became president of a social network that was a fail. It was called Ziggs. You've never heard of it because we were competing with LinkedIn. You know who won that battle. Um, but I learned a ton. I was president in a social network at a time when none of my friends even knew what Facebook was. So I was a pioneer in social media and that was my goal. I would have hoped to succeed in the company. We did have a modest outcome. It was sold to reputation.com, but we're not LinkedIn. We're not the name you know. So that would be true success to me or ultimate success. And then I started the Gromit, which is a product launch platform. I left um, about eight months ago. Um, but I ran it for 12 years. I sold it to Ace Hardware. And the business of the business is to discover undiscovered consumer products and launch one a day to what became a very large audience. We were able to move markets by the time I left the company and we launched products. Now these are sort of oldies, but we launched Fitbit, we launched um, SodaStream, we launched Swell Water Bottles, um, Otterbox, uh, Bomba's Socks. Um, we did some digital services in the beginning. So we launched Google Voice and Kiva, the uh, crowdfunding kind of loan platform. So lots and lots of um, big, big names became, came through Gromit and were given really the first platform on Gromit. So a, a, a true, um, truly innovative product that was also in uh, or a company that was also a labor of love for me because we can get back to that later why did I start it what was the opportunity but what we enabled was um, we created a, a, a kind of a level playing field for the little guy for unexpected entrepreneurs a lot of college entrepreneurs um, came through with really successful products uh, on the grommet but I promised you I wouldn't actually talk about me today or me in the last few years, um, but rather when I was you, because I think that's when everything starts. So uh, in terms of my ability to be an entrepreneur, and I will tell you when I was in EIR, that's an entrepreneur in residence at Harvard Business School, that meant I showed up at the school uh, once a month and I talked to eight different students or teams. I did this for six years. Most are MBA students, but about a third of them were undergrads. And they always had the same two questions, like how do I know I'm cut out for entrepreneurship? And if they had a, a product uh, or a project, they wanted to know if their idea was good enough. Like, should I throw this over? Should I quit school? Should I not take a job? Those kind of really big questions. I'm not gonna address the second one because that's very individual, but the how do I know if I'm cut out to be an entrepreneur this is my own like Jules Pierre theory, but I think that fundamentally the person who becomes an entrepreneur is somebody who generally um, is able to take an unconventional path. And quite often that is the hard path. And so when I ask someone to look for signs of their ability to be an entrepreneur, because you haven't been one yet, like there's no evidence that you could start a business, but there is evidence that you have that DNA. So the things I would look at would be things like um, if you tried out for a play or you um, tried out for a sports team, it's much easier not to try out. And if you succeeded, if you maintained a GPA or you had a demanding part-time job, say when you were in high school or now, those are things that are very entrepreneurial to me because the other path, the alternate path is just easier. 
And entrepreneurship is not for the faint of heart. It can be things like um, you chose to move countries or, or state to come to Michigan when you might've had an easier, more comfortable choice in front of you. It could be, um, this is probably more when you're older, but the person who shows up when someone's sick, that's a commitment that is hard to make. And the people who can make commitments because they have a goal, they have an ambition, they have values that they wanna live up to and take the harder path, that's a really good start for being an entrepreneur. So I'm gonna tell you, sorry, did you wanna say oh, something, no, Eric? Okay. I was just didn't know if you wanted me to, to your point about where you start and kind of all, did you want me to advance to the next slide of, that you have? Next slide, yes. Okay, you got it. So first of all, um, um, entrepreneurs come in all kinds of flavors. I would say I am the queen of rejection. And I'm gonna circle back to that. But first I'm gonna tell you about something that maybe was more of a success. And then I'll tell you about the rejection. So go to the next slide, Eric. So what, what did I try? Um, I grew up in the city of Detroit. Actually go to the next slide, Eric. I kind of put these out of order the more I think about it. Um, the risk I took. There's my house I grew up in, in Detroit. Uh, that's me last year on a road trip, uh, COVID road trip. And this is on the west side of Detroit. My father was an auto worker. My mom was a bank teller and then ultimately stayed home. We had four kids. Um, she had four kids. And um, our neighborhood was solidly working class. A lot of people would look like my dad and mom. Nobody who went to college, nobody in my entire you know, immediate family went to college. So um, I went to Detroit public schools and I'm showing you that building on the right. That's um, the back of Murphy Junior High where I went, which is in the city of Detroit. And um, I was in the city schools at a time when they were starting to, to crack. Um, the teachers were mostly still pretty good, but the families families were struggling and the kids I went to school with families were a lot of them were unstable. I was lucky my family was stable, but not everyone's were. And that had implications in the classroom. Um, it, it was, a, it was wild west, you know, between drugs and violence. Uh, it was not fun to show up every day. And I was worried about it and decided I would apply to um, Castec, the exam school in Detroit for a little bit better chance than my local high school. And a teacher told me about a private school that you can go back, Eric, the one I ultimately went to, um, back to the slide I showed before, Kingswood School, Cranbrook. Um, I, I heard about this school. It was an expensive proposition to go to private school, um, but I snuck in my parents' basement and uh, called the school and secretly got an application and applied. It is not because I um, wanted to get away from my parents or my family. It was that I was afraid they would say no and I wasn't gonna take no. And that's kind of the start of being an entrepreneur right there. Um, I wanted to advance this ball before anyone else could get in my way. And ultimately they had to know because I had to apply for financial aid and I couldn't do that without them. And I had to get to the school to take a test. But my first start there was like, I see a vision for myself that isn't being met where I'm at. I'm gonna to try to make, build a bridge to that vision. And the real thing that hardened my, not hardened, but cr created the base for my ability to take risk was in getting into the school and showing up because I was terrified. I had to go to boarding school because um, we had one car and my dad needed it. So I couldn't make the 45 minute drive from Detroit every day. And when I got there, I soon realized that like, if I thought I had algebra one and I signed up for algebra two, I really hadn't had algebra one. Like anything that was a continuation course from my Detroit schooling, I wasn't prepared for. And I'd been a really good student and now I was like the dog's dinner, right? I just didn't have the preparation for a lot of what I was doing. And beyond that, um, again, I'm coming up from a context that's so different than the kids who generally had gone to these private schools in Bloomfield Hills, a wealthy suburb their whole lives. And they look just so much more prepared than I was, so much more confident. 
So every day I would wake up and just literally be sick to my stomach for the first two weeks, solid two weeks. It was horrible. But then something changed. I was in my English class and the teacher asked, had anybody who had done the summer reading and I had cried over the summer reading. I'd never been assigned summer reading before. And we had things like Shakespeare's love, love's labor's lost and Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. I mean like dense, hard reading for a kid. And I looked around the room and I was literally the only person who had done the summer reading. Like the, they were honest, they all admitted they hadn't done it all. I had, and I, and that's when my nausea went away and never came back. I was like, ah, I got this. I know how to work. Maybe some of these kids aren't so willing to work. They don't realize the opportunity. And I had to work to keep my scholarship. I had a grade point minimum. But that experience of facing that nausea and facing those fears became the foundation to every risk I ever took because Here's the thing I've learned over time, that the people who realize their dreams and reach their goals are the same as anyone else. They have fears, they have the nausea or whatever their physical symptom is when they're worried. It could be a headache, it could be overeating, it could be sweating. Like we all have a kind of physical tell when something's upsetting or making us nervous, mine is nausea. But I learned it. I was such a gift at a young age to learn to plow through the nausea to, to something better on the other side. And when I meet adults who basically have regrets because they haven't reached some of their goals, it's often because they have never conquered the ability to walk through that physical fear. It's physical. And I think the worst advice in the world is when somebody tells you that when you make a decision, a hard decision, you know, if it feels good, it'll be the right decision. Because that's not my experience. Quite often, the right choice is the one that feels uncomfortable, the one that upsets me. But I've learned to figure out that that's a growth edge for me, like to welcome it and to walk through it. I don't always succeed. I'm not saying that guarantees succeed, but what you're building, and you can do this now when you take on hard things, if you deliberately walk through that fear, that feeling, that dread, you're building a really important, important muscle and it's your confidence muscle. So embrace it. You can take risks at school that maybe would feel harder later. Do it now is kind of part of my advice for you. Next slide, please or next beyond that, so risk um, and then fail. So how I, so fail, I'm gonna talk about, I already did risk, we'll talk about fail now. Um, remember I told you I'm queen of rejections. So my uh, tradition of being queen of rejection started where you're sitting in Ann Arbor because I went to um, school with no de declared major. I started in the residential college and I had done a ton of art at, um, at my high school, but I put myself on kind of an art diet because I it was almost like punishment. Like I loved it too much. I didn't apply to art school. I didn't see that it could be a career. It was probably the biggest thing. Remember, I don't come from money. I have to provide for myself. I knew that at your age. So I didn't know of art as a route to providing for myself. But then I like, let myself take a sculpture class at the art school, art and design school. And I really loved it. And it brought back a lot of the things that I really enjoyed doing. I'm a good, I was a good student in my other courses, but there was another thing that this kind of fed for me. And I was walking down the halls of the Michigan um, art school. And I saw this display case of a bunch of little models of like consumer products. I think they were like hand drills and mixers. And they look like the real thing, but they were just models. And I, I just like stopped in my tracks, you know, coming from my sculpture class and said, what, who gets to do that? That looks really interesting. Long story short, I learned that was industrial design and I decided to apply. My sculpture teacher encouraged me. I applied, I was rejected. And um, my teacher, my professor, you know, asked me about the experience. And I said, no, you know, too bad. I'm, I guess that dream's gone. I, I, I was rejected. And he said like, hold on a minute. And 
what he told me was that the dean at the time who was making the admissions decisions was quite sick with cancer. He had bigger fish to fry than spent a lot of time on admissions. And he just fundamentally feared that I got kind of caught up in that. So he made an appeal for me. I reapplied. I, I did have to reapply, but he made an appeal for me and I got in and I learned sometimes a rejection has nothing to do with you. I, it was helpful that he, he helped me, but I was qualified. And um, that was a really good lesson to learn young. After I, when I was at Michigan, um, I'm gonna move on to my next failure. Um, my college, my roommate, I had the same roommate for four years. What a gift to make the kind of friends I made at Michigan. They're still some of my best friends. And my roommate, Claudia, and I were quite, sort of similar serious level of students, like similar academic capability. Like we both wanted to, to excel. And um, she shocked me near the end of our undergrad experience when she told me that she intended to go to medical school. It was kind of vaguely in the background, but she like got serious and started applying. And then my like competitive juices like kind of reared up because I'd never considered graduate school for myself. And I like, I kind of benchmarked myself to my friends because I didn't really have any other way to do it like at home. And that, that started to feel like there was a gap, right? And maybe I was not achieving my potential if I didn't think about grad school. So long story short, while I was in undergrad, I applied to Harvard Business School, which was a very ignorant thing to do. I didn't know that they almost, they said they almost never took people right out of undergrad. They want you to have business experience, life experience. I read the almost never as like, well, maybe literally like it was never and I got rejected. I was encouraged in the letter to reapply. Long story short, I did, got in. Uh, great experience for me, but what what does this matter? Why why do these rejections that I kind of like sort of got up and tried again matter? Because when I became an entrepreneur, the hardest thing about my business we'll probably talk about the business, but the thing that became the biggest challenge is we started during the the economic crisis in two thousand and eight. And the capital markets investors were running scared. They the doors were closed. And I struggled so hard to finance the business. Let me tell you, let me quantify how hard that struggle was. I pitched the best of the best uh, venture capitalists in the country. Going to Michigan, going to Harvard Business School, you can get in those doors. I always had great introductions. I had huge advantages. Let me tell you though, 250 rejections. I'll repeat that, 250 rejections. I don't know anyone who's experienced more rejections from the best of the best than myself. We can talk later maybe about how I financed the business, but I never raised venture capital, but the business succeeded. So maybe next slide. This is why, this is what I learned when I didn't get into Michigan art school, when I didn't get into Harvard Business School. This is it for me. I had this in my office, 15 inch high letters. Uh, success is just getting up one more time and you fall down. This was in our kitchen in our office. It wasn't just my office. It was a theme in the business. It's a theme in life for me. And I hopefully have illustrated that to you um, with some of these kind of near your life stage experiences. So just to summarize, I'll go, ahead and go to the next slide, Eric. This is what I learned. I hope, you, I hope you'll uh, try to believe these ideas and maybe you've experienced them already yourself, but rejection is, is rarely personal. If you're going to be that person who can get up one more time than you fall, you have to allow yourself some healing time. Like every time I was rejected from a venture capitalist, I would do two things. I would um, sort of take the night to like lick my wounds and come back fresh the next day. But I'd also manage, um, you can kind of feel when a rejection is coming on from a venture capitalist, they go quiet. And if I, if I, the way I kind of managed my own like mental health was to always have a like live, possible, exciting 
pitch open with it with a, a venture capitalist like I usually had a couple going at once and if I felt a rejection going on and I need it coming on like from somebody I, I hope to to recruit for as an investor I would not talk to that person anytime near the frame when I needed to do a pitch because when you're going to do a pitch you need to be like full of energy and positive and I knew my own psychology was if I get a rejection at 10 o'clock and then at 11 o'clock I have to do a pitch, I'll try hard, but I won't be the best I could be. So there are things you have to do to manage rejection. I'm not saying it doesn't feel bad. It doesn't, you don't need to allow yourself a way of processing it. And mine was sometimes spacing out the rejection, sometimes just like the night. And then usually I'd be back the next morning, like, you know, back on the sun back on the sports field, like it was true. I did pay for Michigan partly by refereeing men's football. And, uh, you know, like that being back out on the field thing was very real to me. Um, I told you earlier about solving to avoid regret. And, and for me, that that's kind of a simple thing. It's um, being able to walk through the fears that often precede a hard decision or just a hard action, like something that's just not going to be a cakewalk um, because it's, I've never regretted anything I did do, even if it failed, but here and there, I would have certain regrets about things I didn't do. And I think that's a common theme, but my, my, my quantity of those regrets is so tiny, it doesn't matter. Um, I don't mind failure, but I, I, I do mind not trying. Um, and I've already talked about the last point, you know, how do you, how do you avoid that? So that's what I have to, to kick us off here. I'm excited to actually talk to you guys. It's so weird to like talk to my own screen and not see any of you or know, know who you are. So let's solve that now with some, some conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for that. That was riveting and wonderful to hear about and to the idea of using a couple more R words uh, to your notion about rejection. Um, I want the students to be able to understand, you know, there's so much to boil down, but from your perspective, you once talked about and you wrote about the importance of even educating your son as he was coming out of his college education, going into the, the entry level world. In addition to embodying an acceptance of rejection and being comfortable with that, you talked about the three R's that you had with resumes and relationships. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so I wondered if maybe you could provide a glimpse into that education that you felt was important to provide him. Yeah, so how do great careers get built? Um, standing where you are, that's probably a black box, right? Who knows? Um, and the thing that you learn a lot about in school is one of the R's, the resume. But there are two other really important arts. I'll talk about all three. The other two are um, your relationships and your reputation. And frankly, those two have more, they determine more about your career than your resume. So your resume is what, what you know it to be. It's, it's a good summary of, of, of your skills and experiences. And I think of a resume as the thing that gets you in the door for an opportunity but play forward to having had, say, your first job and trying for your second job. What really happens when people hire, hire somebody, if at all possible, they, they go to um, what we call back channel references. People who you don't necessarily even provide as references, but because of LinkedIn and other methods, you can find out people who know you. And that's where your reputation comes into bear, where um, the resume may get you the interview, but what that person that you don't even know is necessarily being consultant says, consulted says about you is what's going to determine whether you get the job. It's less, it's, it's not just how you perform an interview or just what you've done in the past. It's your reputation. And it's, in a digital media world, it's easier than ever to, to sort of figure that out. Um, similarly, when you would like to pursue an opportunity and entrepreneurship is uh, Howard Stevenson, a professor at Harvard Business School, somebody I had actually said, I'm gonna botch this, but his definition of entrepreneurship is the pursuit of opportunity without regard to the resources currently under control. 
So that means like, I'm going to do something and I don't have a team yet. I don't have money yet. I don't have the connections I need. And your relationships are what are going to be the bridge to all those things. I was on a call yesterday with somebody um, who's an investor. And right now I'd like to join a board, uh, like a for-profit board. And, and, I, and he and I were trading sort of stories about our careers. And one of the things we both agreed was at this stage, the only thing that matters is who I know. If I'm going to be on a board, who do I know that can help this com company? In the earlier stages of your career, it's about also who can help you. Or if you're going to start a company, you know, how, like you're going to tap every relationship you ever had. So you want to treat those relationships with kid gloves. Like mm -hmm. those are your gems. That is my career. It's who I know and what do they think about me? Pure and simple. I'll give you a um, real life example of how this came to play. It's a little hokey because it's personal, but um, when I moved from Michigan to, to Boston, we didn't buy, even, even when we were married, we didn't buy a house to live and we bought a cottage up in Maine because it reminded me of Michigan, being on a lake. And I have three sons and there's a tradition where this, literally 20, 25 of these young, young men come for a, a, a long, well, kind of a five day weekend every summer. And there's always a one work work project we need done, like all that brawn, you know, could you guys move this thing for us or whatever. One year, the um, job was to build a wood pile and say there are 20 guys, you know, available to work on it. The crowd split into like the people who sort of suddenly disappeared and didn't contribute and the people who kind of half hardly, you know, moved some wood around and the Tommy McKenna. Tommy McKenna um, wasn't just lifting a lot of wood. He noticed that like the pile was being built pretty shoddily and a wood pile will fall over easily unless you build it well. And he became sort of the director of the work. He was putting in as much effort as anyone else, but like a short quality control, essentially like making sure the job got done right. So long story short, when I was moving my company, I needed kind of that kind of, I needed like young, you know, people to help me um, make the move for the company, build the Ikea furniture, deal with the contractors. Cause I was in the old office and I need people in the new office I, I could trust to help direct the work. And I, I asked um, my son, like, you know, your friends all want internships. I can offer that. Like, who would you recommend? And my son was like, Tommy McKenna, like mom, you can trust him. He did that kind of work all summer, like, and um, then he decided he wanted a certain kind of career and he was able to put in his resume that he had been the right hand person to the, to the real person who supervises construction at my company. And that person became a reference to him and Tommy got the job. Why did Tommy get that job? Because he friggin built a good wood pile. That's the connection I'm trying to make for you. Like, you know, people are watching, people care about helping you succeed, but they'll only care if you meet them halfway. That's the point. Tommy That's met cool. us more than halfway. Yeah, we all remember those Tommies when we encounter them like that. And you don't forget those people or those experiences that you bond with through them. Um, to, that, to that point in helping the students kind of advance their ability to be the Tommies and to see them, for those students who don't feel like they maybe have the strength, the interpersonal skills, who maybe feel like that's not really their strong suit or developing a reputation isn't something that they is concretely know how to do. Um, you know, if you had to boil it down to something that they could do, a skill set they could learn, something they could work on that wasn't just perseverance or hard work, but it was something tangible. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. So... I actually think if you're describing somebody who's maybe more introverted, um, I actually think introverts are better at this in some ways. Why? Because we really listen when we meet somebody. Uh, we think before we talk, I'm an introvert, introvert, so I'm very biased about this. Uh, take this with a grain of salt. Um, we, we listen before we speak and I wouldn't say we're all super organized and have great follow through, but it tends to be a way we succeed. Like we don't try to dazzle anyone with brilliance and flash. It's more with substance because uh, that's where we shine. So 
first of all, you're in like total equal footing in a job on that because a lot of what I just said is what it takes to succeed at a job, you know, listening, be attentive to what's around you, following through, delivering, being thoughtful. You don't have to be flashy. In fact, as an investor, I've, it's been interesting to be behind the scenes with other investors when we judge, say, a startup competition. And before I was an investor, I used to be really fascinated with what the venture capitalists would say. And there was one specific example where we listened to two, two pitches from two CEOs. One CEO was the classic, like extrovert, flashy, like, you know, follow them anywhere type person. The woman who came after him was more understated and um, said, you know, I don't know the answer to that question. I'll get back to you. Like she didn't like bullshit anything. And I thought that uh, the investors are going to love the flashy guy. They, they didn't trust him. Like they thought, you know what? Like, I think she would take care of my money and she would tell me if there was a problem and she would let me know when she needed help. And this guy, I don't know. I think he just always bullshit me. So Here's, here's like, let, let me bring this home for you. I think it's a very effective way to build a network at your age. Students get this like pass for being curious, for asking for people's time. Like everybody wants to help you. And you have that pass even out of school for a couple of years, but man, it's like, it's even bigger when you're in the school. The way I usually try to convey that as to students is that you're a charity, you're a nonprofit now. Everyone wants to contribute towards you. Alumni want to give to you. They want to help you. They want to advance your education. And then when you become an alum, you're still a nonprofit, but you're not really in the same way that you are when you're a student. I, I'm so glad you said that. I've had no speaker say that in two years of this course. And I think that's spot on. Well, let, let me give you some jujitsu tips on uh, how to do that, though, how to network. Because um, when you have a framework, it's a lot easier. So let, let me start with like the most terrifying thing people have to do, go to an event. Like there are even extroverts, you know, don't necessarily love the idea of showing up in a room of strangers, but an introvert that's like, you know, I'd rather stay home. So here's what I do if I can. A lot of events have an event, right? Like some kind of listing of who's coming. Or in the case of like where there's a speaker, you know what they look like. Like you kind of at least could know, you could maybe get to them. But let's just start with the attendees. Um, I will reach out to, I, I will take the time, half an hour, an hour to read the Eventbrite list and usually a company affiliations listed. And I will research and find two to three people that I really wanna meet. Like I assign what success to me for that event, meet those two or three people, you can go home. You can do whatever you want after that. So I reach out to them ahead of time. Everybody's insecure. They love it when somebody says, I really want to meet you. I'll be there with like this sweater on and gold earrings. You know, I, I'm going to be looking for you. Um, and I usually find the people. We have a good chat. Sometimes it's what I hope. Sometimes it isn't exchange information. But then I'm like sort of scot free the rest of the evening. And if I'm enjoying myself, I'll have whatever other conversations I want. But I've defined like, what is it I'm trying to do here? I'm not trying to meet the whole world here, but I'm also trying to be careful about how I use everyone's time, my own included. So that's number one. Whether you meet somebody at an event or it's an introduction or you reach out cold, I think there's sort of a good, better, best about how you handle those meetings and the follow-up. First of all, preparation. Again, introverts shine, should shine there. Like walk in, you know, having questions prepared, it's not an amateur move to have your questions written down or on your phone in front of you. It's flattering that somebody took, when you come, when you come in and you see somebody's prepared for the meeting, um, ask your questions and um, have show insight like around the person's life or business. Like, you know, but you don't have to be a genius. Like nobody expects you to know beyond what you can find on Google, but that's, that's good. What's on Google? Some people don't do that. Then afterwards, here's the good, better, best. Um, the good is you follow up. Let's say they offered to introduce you to somebody. That's a pretty, that's a really good outcome from a from a meeting. Like if they they say they'll pass you on to somebody, you follow up pretty quickly. I would say 24 hours, but definitely within 48 hours, with um, you know a kind of basic thank you, and then you remind them what they offered. 
to do for you. Assume they're gonna forget you the minute you walk out of the office, not because you're unmemorable, because they're busy. So make it easy for them. Send them like, you told me you'd introduce me to Eric Zinsky. And um, if there's you know, your LinkedIn link or any context they could use, just write two sentences that they could use to introduce you. Make it so that when they're like in their work day, the thing you're asking for is the easiest thing in front of them. And it, it's gonna be like, check it off the list. Make it so easy for them. And then when you have the meeting, let's say you meet Eric, follow up whenever it happens and say, this is what happens. So that is a very good approach. Better is, um, and now I'm thinking long haul, is if you continue to update that person you met. So every six months, every year, hey, you know, I'm moving into my junior year. I had a great internship at XYZ this summer. Just like Keep them on the radar. When I used to interview someone at Gromit that I thought was a potential talent, but we didn't have a job right then, I would give them an assignment to make this easy for them because I genuinely wanted to stay in touch with them. I would say, I don't need to hear a lot all the time, but every six months, just shoot over an email. Tell me your favorite Gromit you've seen lately. Like, because we launch a product every day. I mean, it's like watching a little video. That's not a hard ask, but it told me they actually cared about my business at a level that was reasonable. I wasn't asking for them to do a lot of work. Mm -hmm. So just give people an update, that's better. Best is, let's say you talk to Eric and you learn, you know, he used to be on a crew team or he loves, you know, the Detroit Lions or, or his daughter plays piano or whatever it is. You learn some tidbit about him that makes you aware of his interests. Best is every once in a while you can send an article, a link, that relates to him, nothing to do with you. And I do that physically quite a lot, even though I could send a link from the newspaper, I often cut out, I, I do read a lot of print media, which I know is, makes me really old, but I just enjoy it. So I'll literally cut out articles instead of sending the link because it's so rare, right? Like I like thank you letters by paper too for an important event too. Um, I don't think email is good enough, or at least it's, it doesn't give you an edge. You do need to send an email quickly but if it's a really important meeting, I would also follow up with paper just because like you want every edge. You get the first touch with the email and the second touch a week later with a physical letter, like just a note. So these are yeah. my, some of my pro tips. I, I, I have a, a deck built out that says exactly everything you just did. So just so wonderful oh, to hear from Isaiah. It's perfect. Your, your students are so lucky because this well, freaking I mean, stuff's that, hard, I, to, hard I, to learn. Yeah. This, this is like trial and error. I'm not trying to sell my book, but the fourth chapter of my book talks about all this in detail because uh, as an entrepreneur working with your network, and in my case, I had to really build an entrepreneurial network once I started Gromit because I didn't, I had just moved back from Ireland. I didn't know a lot of people in Boston at that stage. So even at my stage, I was 47, I had to build the network. And so I realized that was my top talent as an entrepreneur. So I wrote a whole chapter about it. My book is about how to be an entrepreneur, but that chapter is kind of for anyone. Mm, that's perfect. You know, one of the questions I, I want to ask you, this wasn't kind of on my list, but to your point there about networking and the tactical approach to that, when I've spoken to students about this in the past, um, I usually always have a couple female students who will say, you know, I don't always feel comfortable following up in that way or showing interest in the same way that you described. How can I kind of uh, pivot my approach to ensure that it's, um, it's, it's taken and observed as, in a way that showcases my professional interest and not anything different? Um, any thoughts uh, from you on, on that? Or is that something that you have seen people contend with? I... I remember, I mean, I had some, a couple of ugly situations that when I was a student where uh, the party on the other side was a bad actor, you know, tried to take advantage of me, like, you know, Hollywood movie stuff. Um, but I don't encounter, I didn't encounter that much post my student days. Yeah. I think because, and that was a long time ago, like these creepy guys would be in jail now. Like, you know, yeah. the, nothing happened, by the way. I was... I'm a Michigan grad, I can handle myself. I got out of those situations fast, but um, yeah. I don't know, in a professional context, it seems less likely 
to happen, but I don't want to be naive or dismissive because these people are asking, those are, that's a hard thing to even say to you or to faculty or to a peer. Yeah, it's a difficult question. I, I never know entirely how to answer, um, but given your articulation of what you were talking about, I wondered if maybe you, you had thoughts on that, but to that point. The one always, message I would have is like, my guess is if those, those situations arise, it's not you, it's them. You probably mm -hmm. did everything you should mm -hmm. and they're being jerks. Mm -hmm. Like it's on them and get yourself out of there. Like, and you don't I want to like that, company your person anyways. Right, mm -hmm. right, it's a right. But I can't imagine a Michigan grad writing an email or having a conversation that would be wildly misleading about her intentions. Like right. be pretty unlikely. So then what do you say? Well, the guy, if it's a guy chose to misinterpret the situation and that's mm -hmm. on him not you mm -hmm. it, it, so i could spend the next five hours talking with you unfortunately we have about four minutes left in class before uh, our large class breaks um but to your your point that you keep making which i i'm so glad that you're talking about there's a there's a reputation around michigan and in michigan grads and of the type of student and the caliber and alike that that are produced here you've spent time at Harvard, you, you've had the successful career, your roots are back here in Southeast Michigan. Talk to the students candidly about what the perceived distinction is that Michigan produces, the type of student that goes here, what makes them uniquely uh, valuable and strong when they're competing against peers from other institutions for entry level jobs or for the rest of their career. What is it that's different? Well, there's, there's the part that is separate from you as an individual, which is, you know, such a top tier university, public university, you draft off of that. Like, it's just fact, Michigan is first in so many areas, engineering in particular. Oh my gosh, when I took my kids on a tour there, I couldn't leave all the top ranked aspects of our engineering program. Um, so you can draft off that, but there would be a sense that these kids or these young adults, these professionals are here to work. I'll give you an example. It's not gonna be about Michigan, but it would apply to Michigan. Uh, my oldest son went to Carnegie Mellon, which um, has a strong engineering program as well. And a venture capitalist in San Francisco put him to work in his portfolio companies. And this guy um, taught at the Stanford school so he had access to Stanford students of all stripes and I asked him Michael what and then he started helping my son post-grad he got helped him get every job he's ever had all three jobs he's had this friend has helped this venture capital has helped him, my son get but back then right out of school I asked my Michael you know why are you helping my son so much you know you have all these Stanford kids. And he said, you know what, those Stanford kids, like they want to come in and tell everyone else what to do. A kid from Carnegie Mellon is going to actually do the work. Yeah. And that's, that's that, I'm sorry, it's not an example about Michigan, but that's exactly what I would say. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to bring the smarts of Stanford or, you know, any other place and the preparation but in the real world, you know, somebody will actually do the work and understand the tenacity required some of it's being in the Midwest too. I think that's a positive, right? Like, uh, you know, the whole, you're not even in Detroit. Like you don't get any credit for being near Detroit, but there, that vibe of like getting, getting things done, you get to draft off of it. And it's, it's real. I think people would, you know, for better or worse, just also think you're going to be a normal person. Yeah. Like, so you know, so whether got, you come from Michigan or not. Yeah, we've got one minute left and just a, a rapid fire kind of response to your point that they're not in Detroit, so you don't get credit for being in proximity. If they are to take the field trip down, jump on a bus, get in their car to go down, the one place in Detroit that everyone should probably go check out, see, you should really get this to this to know Detroit or eat here or whatever it might be. What do you got? Uh I think it's it's kind of simple. If you ride the Q line, it's really fun. And, and there are just so many great stops along the Q line that's on Woodward, you know, the main street in Detroit, mm -hmm. very short little surface street subway or tram. Yeah. And um, that'll, that'll put you in a lot of good spots. Perfect. Well, can't thank you enough for sharing your time. This is absolutely wonderful. I'm sorry we don't have longer, but um, 
thank you so much for helping us and, uh, and giving the students a peer into everything that you've been able to learn. And then uh, if it's okay with you, we had a couple of student questions that came in that I will send you an email with afterward and anything that we can get and uh, produce for a response would be great. And then uh, sure. that's it. So thank you very much. Thank you students. Hope you have a great weekend. Stay safe and um, stay warm.